it's so beautifully pushed up. Beautiful sunset. Oh my god, the most beautiful time of the day. Guys, we have a porcupine. I have never seen a porcupine in my life. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> I mean, let's just see if he's still there. Wow. <laughs> I can't see him. Can you, Lala? No. No? Okay, I guess that was our sighting. Oh my god. I have never seen a porcupine in my life. Even after all these years of traveling in the wildest places in India and Africa, I've never seen a porcupine. And for us to just be driving around, bumbling around right after the gate and to see a porcupine. Wow. <laughs> This is going to be a good day. You know, some people believe that porcupines actually shoot out their quills and injure animals or injure people. <laughs> uh, they do nothing of such, but that would be a pretty cool... What? Oh, jackal. Three jackals. Wow, right there. Tiger? The four jackals and they're howling. Look at that. Wow. Oh, they're fighting. <laughs> oh my god. Wow, we got four jackals and they're running away from something. I think two of them are young and one of them is older. We're about to cross the road in the front. Right there. One crossed the road, others are coming. I'm just gonna move away from the camera. Whoa. Look how fast they are this morning. Something definitely scared them. I wonder what it was that scared them. What do you think, Lala? I think tiger Lala thinks there's a tiger because they were howling, but 
in the meantime, I'm just going to quickly tell you guys, uh, the porcupines do nothing of such that we were talking about, which is shoot their quills out. <laughs> Although that would be a very cool superpower to have. Um, but they are mainly there for protection because they're very slow animals. They're mainly nocturnal. Uh, they can't climb trees and they mainly walk on the ground. So anything and everything can eat them unless they have those quills. Sorry, I thought I heard something. And that doesn't mean nothing eats them. Uh, sometimes honey badgers can kill, uh, kill them. Um, even tigers, leopards and sloth bears try killing them, but then they get the quills stuck everywhere. And it's really, really painful. The quills aren't poisonous. Again, a misbelief, but it is still very painful. And if they're not taken off, which because tigers and leopards don't have those de dexterous paws, sometimes they're not taken off. And over the time, they catch infection and slowly they die. A sad way to die, a painful way to die, alarm call. There's a tiger here, 100%. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, alarm calls. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> Let it roll there, roll there and on Lala. Lala, here you go, the binoculars. Those calls were amazing. Wow. So we are in Bajrang's territory and Bajrang is a huge male tiger but he's not fully grown yet but he's pretty massive. He's just about four years old and he travels between Kitali and Mukti. But this territory also belongs to a female. Her name is Muhammad. She's quite a shy female. Nonetheless, very beautiful. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle. So this is where the calls are coming. Are you ready? Yeah, this is where the calls are coming from. There's a jackal right here. Right here. He's definitely sniffing something. Oh, scent walking. Cute. <laughs> Another scent marking and territory marking. 
I don't know why the jackal is going back there, to be honest, because all the cheetah alarm calls were coming from here. And his buddies, his buddies left and... His buddies were pretty scared. That's interesting. A lot of people believe that jackals are only scavengers. Mostly they are, but they can also hunt really well. Uh, especially if there are three or four of them together, they can try taking on a small animal. Uh, a normal pair can usually take down a cheetah fawn easily. And we've even seen some kill shots. In fact, in fact, when we were here with a group tour, I was leading a group tour. Jackal howling. Tiger sitting down somewhere. And the jackal is letting the... And the jackal is letting the forest know about it. Yeah, so in fact, just a couple of days ago when we were leading, I was leading the group tour on safari with Suyash, uh, real life experiences. We were in a water hole just nearby and we saw three jackals on a kill. Uh, in the meantime, when we were waiting, I'm just going to play that footage for you guys. So what I'm thinking right now is, oh, the jackal's coming right here. The jackal's coming right here in front of me. Right here, right here, follow my hand. Follow my hand, follow my hand right here. Yeah, there he is. He's gonna cross the road. There are two more jackals coming right there. Beautiful. So what I'm thinking right now is that maybe there's a kill nearby and the tiger is probably sitting there and eating. And that's why these jackal keep coming back and forth just to check it out. And because they want to scavenge, but then they come back and see that the tiger is still eating and feeding on it. And then that's why they run away. Of course, that's just a probability and guesswork. Because if you notice the jackal, he keeps looking that, say, that way. Hello everyone, a very good morning from Bandhavgar National Park and welcome to another edition of Virtual Safari. I'm your host Suyash Keshri, I'm a professional wildlife filmmaker and presenter and I will be your host for this series. Behind me on the first camera is Himanshu, on the second camera we have Nitin and our guide Lala. We're here in Central India in Madhya Pradesh in Bandhavgar National Park, one of the most densely populated tiger reserves in the world. Uh, here we are in one of the tourism zones, which is Magdi. Uh, we were here in yesterday as well. And the first day, of course, in the morning, we were in Tala. So I hope you've watched other episodes. If you haven't, please do check them out. Uh, definitely the first episode for the introduction of how the series works. 
But for now, I'm gonna start driving and let's see what we find. It's an absolute pleasure to host you in this experience. Come on along, just make sure you hold tight because the roads get bumpy. And it's a nice and cool morning here in Bandhukar. It's about 15 degrees Celsius, but in the daytime, it's supposed to heat up to about 38, 39 degrees Celsius. I like this right now, but I'm not looking forward to the heat. Beautiful sounds of birds this morning. Uh, it's a little cloudy though, so the sun hasn't filtered through yet. So I hope it does not rain because that really causes a lot of issues for us filming like this. So we just we just entered the park and we'll keep on going and bumbling around very slowly looking for anything and everything that we can find. Beautiful smell of sal trees this morning. The sal flowers especially. Namaste, namaste, namaste. It's amazing the weather patterns, how they change. Sometimes in the mornings you are freezing and yet in the afternoon you want to jump into a bucket full of ice. That's how nature is, right? It's not consistent every day. Every day is a new day, every day is different. Every day brings a ray of new hope and a change. And that's what I love about it. A lot of people ask me, don't you get bored in the same forest? seeing the same animals and I say, no, not at all. Okay, so I just took a loop to see if there's any movement there, but I'm just gonna stop where we saw the jackals last time, but I'm gonna park there. Unfortunately, this road is, uh, is closed. You see the barricade right here and we're not allowed to go into it. I'll ask Himanshu to show you an angle of it from this way as well. This is actually a closed off road where we were seeing the jackals. Um, I would drive into it if you had the permissions, but this comes into the area which is completely cordoned off. So according to Supreme Court regulations set in 2012, only 20% of the national park is open for tourism. The rest 80% is maintained as an inviolate space and only the Department of Forest and officers can be active there or conservationists who are working on veterinarian programs or relocation programs can be active there. Um, if you go straight though in this, it actually connects to Tala. Matala is another zone here. In Bandhagar, we have six different zones. Kalwa, Magdi, Tala, Khitoli, Panpatha and Pathor. And of those zones, only three are accessible to tourists. That's Tala, Magdi and Khitoli. And in case you don't know, Bandhagar is about 1,600 square kilometers of pristine wilderness. Um, but that pristine wilderness slowly and surely is being chipped away in some places because of upcoming development. But the Forest Department here and, and Madhya Pradesh state authorities are doing all that they can to preserve this wilderness. And that's why you have such high sightings of tigers and other wildlife here. Sorry, I thought I heard something. So we're just gonna wait here and see. But this morning has been absolutely cracker with the sighting of porcupine and these four jackals, especially the jackal howling. 
Wow, you don't hear that often. Okay, since we're waiting here, um, we know there's a tiger nearby, and we're just waiting here, we're gonna do some birding. Uh, I can't see much, but I can hear a lot. And over the time, your experience teaches you to identify different bird sounds. So right now, what I can hear, the grrr, 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 that sound is of a jungle owlet. Interestingly, oh, another galam call. Interestingly, the jungle owlet is one of the only birds uh, or only owls that actually hunts in daytime. And here, here is a jungle owlet. So this is the jungle owlet. It's paler street uh, with, and has bars below. Quite an interesting look, looking owl. Another owl that you usually hear is number 15, which is a spotted owlet. And some of the other animals, or rather other owls that are... Oh. It's Kenya? It's a jackal. Okay. So the other owls that are seen in Bound of Gar is of course the collared scops owl. Right here. Usually seen in different uh, holes, rather burrows. Then we also have the I already told about jungle owlet. I'll see give me a sec. Yes. We have the mottled wood owl in central India. The brown wood owl. Then, I don't think we find, we don't get down, downy fish owl, right? No. no, we don't get downy fish owl. We do get the brown fish owl, which is number six. So you see, they look quite similar. Of course, this is tawny color. This is a little pale brown, um, but we do get brown fish owl. And what else, nine number. Yeah, we get the barn owl, extremely beautiful. Then we also get Eurasian eagle owl, which is right here, 13 A and B. Um, one's a juvenile, one's an adult, female, male as well. Uh, and yeah, we don't get short-eared owl here in Bandhagra National Park. But those are our owls. So it's always important to carry around a book like this, especially if you want to learn, because you can learn a lot about these owls, where their distribution is of different species all over India, uh, whether they're endangered, whether they are commonly found, whether they're vulnerable. And how you navigate this kind of book is that usually in the front, they have a key. So when I'm looking for the owl, all I have to look for is the kind of uh, outline of an of a bird that looks like an owl. And this one looks like an owl. So that's why I go to 47 to 48, which is not the page number, but rather the plate number. And that's how you navigate a lot of these books. Otherwise, you're gonna keep searching through and flipping through. Okay, you can hear the brain fever bird. And that is the common hawk cuckoo. <laughs> it's, I don't know who comes up with these, but this cuckoo uh, screams, brain fever, brain fever, brain fever. <laughs> Let me just f find that for you as well. So it's not always about seeing the bird. It's um, often about just observing the sound of them. Let me just see. And common hakuku is this one. So this is the bird that is screaming brain fever. So what are the identifying features? Uh, they can be mistakable for a shikra but they are not shikra. Uh, shikras don't have this the stripe here and shikras don't have yellowish eyes. Shikra usually have the reddish orange eyes. They have, so cuckoos also have longer tail than shikra and more pointed wings. 
see, if you see in the book right here, it says loud shrill. Or, or brain fever, brain fever. Repeated in long sequence at diminishing intervals. Each phrase higher in pitch, raising to crescendo. And that's exactly what we hear. I love this. I could do it all day. What else can we hear? You can hear. You can hear this. That kind of sound. And that's basically coming from a coppersmith bar bed. And right here. It's actually a tiny little bird and it prefers sitting on top of the trees. It's most widespread in common barbet and it has a distinctive head pattern. The reason it's called coppersmith barbet is because every time a coppersmith strikes something, you hear the cut, 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 or like puck, 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 puck. And that's why it's named after the coppersmiths and coppersmith's barbet. Here as well, if you see, the, the, the tune is like the compass with power. Okay, I hear an alarm call right on the road, so I'm just going to take it real quick. Are you on hold on? So I just heard an alarm call as well and then Lala immediately said, sir, let's go in the front and let's just check out what this alarm call is for. The alarm call came from this patch of the forest. Huh? I'm just going to stop here real quick. More vehicles coming in. Morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> Seems like we're the only ones willing to wait. Patience pays off though. So right here in front of me is the jamun tree, if you can show this tree. Beautiful green leaves, new leaves of jamun coming through. And if you zoom back out and come here to the book, this is the identification of a jamun tree. It's a pretty large tree. Pretty large tree. It actually belongs to the eucalyptus family, which not many people know about. What's jamun tree known for is these fruits. They are absolutely delicious. They come at the end of summer or during the monsoon season, depending on the time of the, uh, or depending on the location the jamun tree is in. And they're absolutely amazing. Lots eaten by humans, jackals, bears, civets, and a host of other jungle creatures also used in folk medicine. The fruit is eaten as a tonic and for strengthening the teeth and gums. It's often 
that they make vinegar from it to treat chronic diarrhea and diseases of spleen. There's so many different uses that different trees in Central India or across the world have. The tiger has just eaten the deer or killed the deer. <laughs> No, that's a sick joke, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the deer is actually just making a rutting call, uh, which is a mating call. But those are some interesting facts about Jaman. What is also interesting is you see the bark, if you zoom in, that bark is pretty, pretty thick. So it was once used and employed for tanning leather and to make enduring brown dyes. I hear the alarm call of monkey piche. And then, no? It was used to make brown dyes. It was used to treat different kinds of leather. Jamun is also planted as a shade tree in different parts of India. All right, we'll keep going. Lala, where should we go to? I think tigers Okay, cool. So I think our plan then would be, um, you know, there's a this road goes very straight, and then it goes towards left, towards late Solos territory, which is now occupied by two different females, and then it goes towards right, and merges into Dotty's territory and then goes again further to Davadol's territory and then forms a circle back to Solo's territory. Yesterday in the evening, we decided to check out Dotty and Davadol. But while we were waiting here, a lot of vehicles passed us, so they must have already checked Davadol, they must have already checked Dotty. But most of the vehicles must not have checked Sahara, which is late Solo's area. So, I'm not sure if we're going to go and check Sera or we're going to go and check something else. Once we come to the, the, the transition point where the road bifurcates, we're going to make a decision then. <laughs> and until then, just enjoy the forest, see if we can see anything else. But this has been a great morning and it's an absolute pleasure to have you on this experience. Beautiful salt trees, look at the greenery. Uh, if you see here, there's some construction going on right here and what they're basically doing is they're creating a water hole for the wildlife and they're installing solar panels and they're making it high because the elephants, the wild elephants had been breaking them, the smaller solar panels on the floor. So they're making it actually really high and sturdy. Speaking of elephants, in October of 2018, Bandhavgarh got very lucky because 40 or actually that time it was only 16, 16 elephants decided to walk all the way from state of Odisha, cross the state of Chhattisgarh and then enter Madhya Pradesh and then they found their way into Bandhavgarh National Park. They absolutely loved the habitat, there was enough foliage for them, enough water for them and they decided to stay here. And now that number 16 has grown to 48 because others have joined. Some have even given birth. That just shows the viability of a national park like this. The conservation efforts to protect it have been so successful that now we have our own big five. Elephant, um, sloth bear, tiger, leopard, and of course the Indian gaur. So that's fantastic. I've seen the elephants a couple times. Since there are only about 48 of them right now, 48 or 50 of them, in a 1600 square kilometer radius, they're very elusive. They're also not used to humans, so anytime they see humans or even vehicles, they actually run away. Um, and right now, what I've, what I've got the information for the past few days is they're actually in Panpatha Pathor area, where unfortunately we're not allowed to go. But I've seen them in Magdi, I've seen them in Tala, I've seen them in Kitoli, and I often see the, the footprints of a lone male, because males tend to stay away from, from uh, from the herd 
unless it's mating season or breeding time rather and what is going to be really cool is that over the years these elephants will get more comfortable with humans around with 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 tourist vehicles around and then you'll have instances like you have in Corbett or in the south where you see tigers and elephants together in one frame or or other animals together in one frame and especially more than anything i want to see elephants in some of the iconic backgrounds of bandhavgarh like the like the plateau in the background bandhani in the background beautiful grasslands and elephants there some interesting water holes with elephants there so we've got a long way to go with me and bandhavgarh long way to go for me and elephants together here and of course with you joining me virtually from all across the world ah uh, langur got a male langur right in front of us right here what have you been eating dude i wonder if the, he's been eating something or if that's just his spit okay there he goes we've also got some deer over there two males three males actually there's a bachelor group bachelor herd far off in the distance you can barely see its antlers if you go a little more to the right you'll see one yeah two of them there they are just foraging away in peace gorgeous all right we're going to keep going we're going to keep going and see what else we can find these guys were kind of hidden otherwise we would have gone a better view at them so lala how are you doing Do you think it'll rain today? Yeah, but I hope it doesn't rain. <laughs> it looks so cloudy. Look at the landscape here. You see, it's so cloudy right now, especially if you pan the camera up. The sun is struggling to come out of the clouds. Uh here we have another forest camp. This is where the forest guards live. And they spend most of their time here. They leave for foot patrolling around 5 a.m. in the morning and they come back around 9 or 10, make some breakfast and then leave again for a little bit or do some chores like cooking, cleaning, um logging and talking to talking to different forest officers reporting the findings of the day making sure that they know that everything is okay and then after lunch they leave again around 4 p.m. after taking a little bit of rest and then 4 to 8 9 they're roaming around they come back and have dinner and then alternate days they tend to go out or in random pattern they tend to go out and see and foot patrol at night even in fact in order to help the forest guards me and a few of my friends from fable in main nikita mehta and akash mehta we made a huge donation to bandhavgarh national park there are 175 camps in bandhavgarh national parks and of them many were not electrified of course we did not want to electrify them through uh, through physical cables because that's dangerous to wildlife as well and the forest so we donated 175 lamps what's that oh my bad <laughs> sometimes wooden logs appear to be like a tiger or leopard so i got a little confused yeah so we donated 175 solar lamps they can also use those solar lamps to charge their phones so in the night if they're walking somewhere maybe they need they used to use the restroom a lot of the places a lot of the camps do not even have restrooms uh, so they have to actually go into the forest or if they're walking at night they can use the solar lamps or even when in the monsoon season when the electricity is completely cut off 
they can use the the, the solar lamps to do their work within the camp itself. We also donated, uh, we helped over 200 forest staff and donated shoes to them so that they can walk longer, their feet are not as sore. We also donated torches, again, which are solar powered, and both the torches and the lamps can actually charge their phones too because they have little nifty USB ports. And then the last thing that we donated was bags and backpacks so that can help them put all the stuff in. And in the meantime, when we're driving, I'm just gonna play some footage or some photographs of the donations and see all the happy f and beat guards here in Bandhavgarh National Park. Uh, we are going to talk to them and understand how difficult it is to be someone who is trying to protect and conserve the forest and the, and the different animals that live here. Varma ji, tell us a little bit about people. Our patrol is doing our patrol. I take my room from the room and take my room from the room and take my room from the room. We go to the patrol. तो नदी भी देखते हैं पगडंडिया भी देखते हैं जहाँ के टाइगर का मूवमेंट भी होता है और वहाँ पहाड़ी वहाड़ी घूम बाग के दस साढ़े दस बजे अपने वापस रूम आते हैं बारह पंद्रह साल से काम कर रहे हैं आप तो उसमें जैसे आप बीट गार्ड है और आप जाते हैं पेट्रोलिंग के लिए तो आप लोग को काफी रिस्की चीज है क्योंकि आप लोग पैदल जाते हैं पैदल आते हैं कोई गाड़ी वाहन तो है नहीं तो अगर टाइगर मिल जाए तो टाइगर मिल जाता तो उसको सामना करते हैं दस पांच मिनट बैठ करते हैं इसके बाद यदि वो रास्ता छोड़ दिया तो ठीक है ये हम लोग रास्ता सक्षम करते हैं और दूसरी रास्ता निकल जाते हैं हाँ लेकिन काफी रिस्की मामला है काफी रिस्की कभी कभी टाइगर अटैक भी करता है दौड़ता भी है हम लोग दौड़ाता है लेकिन अपन लोग हिम्मत लेकर डंडा लेकर खड़े रहते हैं पास पास में आ जाते दो चार तीन अटैक करता है देखिए क्या है की सही ढंग से व्यवस्था तो है नहीं है न कभी कभी टाइगर रात को नौ बजे दस बजे कैम्प के पास आकर बैठ जाता है वहीं लोग फिर मैसेज देते हैं तो अपन लोग फिर जाते हैं उनको हटाने के लिए दो चार और मिलके ये भी कोई बाहन है नहीं तो आप पहले चलते हैं लगाओ गया था अपने पुलवामा कैम्प जहाँ पे मैं तो इस तरह के सारी कठिनाइयों के साथ अपन लोग और फिर मैंने देखा भी है काफी सारे कैम्प में बिजली नहीं है पानी की सुख सुविधाएं नहीं है नहीं हर कई पोम की व्यवस्था नहीं कैंपे में नहीं और मच्छरों का बहुत प्रॉब्लम मलेरिया मच्छर मलेरिया तो है आप लोग ये काम क्यों करते हैं नहीं ये हम काम इसलिए करते हैं कि एक तो हमारा कर्तव्य है हम लोग सर्विस किए नौकरी किए हैं तो अपनी ड्यूटी को तो पाबंद है आदमी उसमें सजग रहेगा जब तक यहाँ रहेंगे बांधोगढ़ में तब तक अपने वन्य प्राणी वन्य की सुरक्षा करना हमारा कर्तव्य है न जंगल से लगा हुआ हाँ जंगल से लगा हुआ है जंगल में हमारा बहुत कुछ है प्रकृति का सब कुछ है जंगल में तो ही मंगल है तो यही कर क्या है कि जंगल ना होता जंगल का महत्व आदमी समझता है जंगल हमारे को ऑक्सीजन देता है जो हम कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड छोड़ते तो ऑक्सीजन से वो कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड ग्रहण करता है और वो जो ऑक्सीजन छोड़ता है हम ग्रहण करते हैं तो जंगल से और जीवों से प्राणियों से इतना बड़ा संबंध है जितना क्या बताए उसको नहीं ये बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट काम है तो मैं आप लोगों को थैंक यू बोलना चाहूंगा आपका काम नहीं कर सकते कभी भी ऐसे लेकिन ये हमारे तरफ से आपको बस ये तुलना है कि थैंक यू जो भी आप करते हैं धन्यवाद और आप हमारे देश के 
सबसे महत्वपूर्ण जानवर को सबसे महत्वपूर्ण जंगलों को बचा रहे There you saw all those happy faces and that's the thing right if you want to help in conservation then try helping the people who are directly involved and that is mostly the forest staff the rangers the veterinary service officers that you need to help if you can't make a donation a simple heartfelt thank you for the job that they do will help because that is a morale booster which doesn't come often it's a very thankless profession that they do and india's forests will not be all that they are without their help and without their support and dedicated tireless work so if you are the family members or if you yourself are someone who works in the forest department in india or you've been involved in the forest department or conservation my heart goes out to you and i thank you very much for your service and i also would like to salute you so you might notice we're driving across a fence the fencing has been broken now but what actually happened is that there used to be a female known as kankati junior she was actually the sister of solo and her mother was raj vera a couple of years ago kankati junior was killed in an unfortunate incident and at that time she had cubs she had made it with bamera son and for a few days when when she died bamera son was found here looking for her uh, and literally her cubs and bamera son were growling the deep throated growl just trying to look for her like oh 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 like that and it it, it was really really heartbreaking and for a couple of days bamera son actually took care of the cubs but the cubs were too young and they were getting frail so lala i just want to confirm i believe that that one of the cubs was not successfully able to hunt but two of the cubs were so where were they released i think in satpura sir that's right i think i heard that information too sometimes all this information is so secret that you don't get to hear it so one of the cubs actually is in it is in an enclosure and then two of the cubs who learned how to hunt were successfully reintroduced to another national park which is satpura national park lala right or left which one should we take left okay lala has decided we're going to go towards sahra and my favorite favorite location so you see conservation is very tricky despite the best efforts one of the cubs was not able to learn how to hunt okay maybe some someone is seeing something over there they've just parked the vehicle or maybe they've just heard an alarm call so there's an alarm call yeah stop right here i'm just going to take the vehicle back us road mein thoda piche se modta hu yahan kaat do हाँ मैं भी आ रहा हूँ ओके सो देर सांबर अलार्म कॉल्स सॉरी सो देर सांबर अलार्म कॉल्स दर आर गोइंग ऑन ओ माई कार स्टक आई मैन पुट दिस इन फोर व्हील ड्राइव
Yeah, the sambar alarm calls are still going on and they're moving that way actually. Back to two wheel drive and off we go. You have to be so quick at these things, otherwise you're going to miss it. Okay, see. Okay. Is this good? Is this good? PIP wo. All right. I'm not really sure what Lala is trying to ask me to do. But I will ask him. Or I will rather listen to him. Theek hai? Okay, now I understand. Lala wanted us to be in a perfect position so we can go here as well as here. <laughs> Thank you, Lala. Okay, we're just gonna keep quiet and listen. Sabar, I'm gone. Sambar beats 100% tiger because Sambar is the largest deer so they don't have to fear leopards, they don't have to fear sloth bear, they don't even have to fear any of the smaller snakes like even the python which deer usually fear but with tigers they always fear tigers and when a Sambar alarm call goes through there's 100% a tiger in the vicinity. Does the tiger, does that mean you'll see a tiger 100%? We don't know. If the tiger decides to show itself, or if it's easily found, then it's a different scenario altogether. My heart is pumping. Guys, what do you think? Somber alarm calls are coming from here, and the deer alarm calls are coming from here, which means the deer is just another deer, another Lamgur alarm calls. So I think the Lamgur alarm calls are more of a supporting alarm. Have some coffee this morning and just to sip away. Cheers. <laughs> this specific path and this spray mark that I these are very fresh. Jump on the hind legs, come scratching down. Egyptian vulture, rejoin and fix the fencing here. It's huge! Throughout the series, we're gonna be cutting small segments to learn and get deeper into some aspects of wildlife, about trees, birds, and different species that we've been seeing. Right now, I'm next to a tiger pug mark. In the parks, we're not allowed to get down, but here we are in a lodge and the tiger happened to pass through this. You could see right here is a pug mark and right next to it is a bike track. So if you come closer, let's study this a little bit. So as you can see, this is the pug mark and this is the tires of a bike or a bicycle. I can't really make sure. Actually, it is a bike because it's pretty wide right here. So it's a bike that has passed through here and the tiger has passed through here as well. Now, first things first, we need to make sure we need to understand this tiger pug mark very well. What are some things that you need to know? First, you need to know who this individual is. I mean, is it a male or a female? Number two, you need to know when this male or female passed through here. Number three is the health of the tiger. So let's, let's take a closer look. What I have right next to me is a phone and we're gonna place it next to the pug mark. Now see, I usually do it with my fingers and once I place it next to my, fing next to my fingers, I know that this is a male's pug marks. But 
we need to get a clear look. So if you have a measuring tool, maybe a scale, or, or if you know the dimensions of your phone, or maybe your um, multi-tool kit, place it next to the pug marks. Our iPhone right here is approximately 5.8 inches. Females have a pug mark about three and a half to four and a half inches. And when it comes to males, it can be from four all the way till five and a half inches. And if I place my phone right here, you can see I said this is 5.8 inches and this pug mark then is right about five to five and a half inches. We're also in a kind of a soil that is sandy. So the pug mark has kind of spread out. The five to five and a half inches or four to five and a half inches has to be both in length as well as in breadth. So see length is about five to five and a half inches. And here is the breadth again, five to five and a half inches. Another thing that gives it away as a male is if you look, the pug marks are kind of squarish in appearance. We will show you photos of a male versus a female pug marks. Female pug marks are much more elongated, whereas male pug marks are more squarish. Especially the pads at the back, these indentations appear more square and these appear more square. So you can actually kind of make a square next to the pug mark. Whereas in a female, you'll only be able to make a rectangle because the toes are a little more elongated and the pug marks itself is more narrow. Okay, so we waited for quite a little bit and we've decided to move on because the alarm calls have stopped. That probably means that whatever the subject was, most likely it was a tiger. I say subject because I'm a photographer and filmmaker, right? But <laughs> whatever the animal was, it's moved off either deeper into the forest or just sitting down and sleeping. So we're, de we're gonna decide, or we have decided to move, move away and then keep going. And I think we're gonna go to Sarah as discussed earlier. And I'm gonna talk about a few things there. The landscape is absolutely beautiful. And of course, there's the, the infamous cave where Solo was filmed along with her cubs and killed. Lala was just talking to other guides and, and naturalists, just asking what's going on, what about the call. So it's good to be com in communication with everyone, uh, especially because in Bandhavgarh you're not allowed to have, or any of the national parks in India, you're not allowed to have wireless systems to respect the privacy of the guests as well as the, as, as the animals in the forest to make sure that poaching is under control because if you have a wireless, it could easily be hacked. So. That's why you need to just rely on talking to each other and which is totally fine. And there is something very beautiful and captivating about finding a tiger or a leopard or anything or tracking anything, even a deer on your own. It's very fulfilling. I don't think the sun is going to come up today. <laughs> I hope you guys aren't feeling too cold out there. The weather is still nice. If you hear that kind of sound in a forest, it is the sound 
of an Indian magpie robin. Pretty common bird all across India. It has a beautiful black and white pattern running against its body. Usually a whitish chest, blackish head and wings. It's also called the singing bird of India because of its beautiful calls. Uh, since I'm driving, I'm not going to be able to show it on, your, on my book, but we're going to play some photos for you guys so you can see and get the reference of the bird I'm talking about. Ooh, I felt a droplet of... No, please don't rain. <laughs> I felt a droplet of water. I hope it doesn't rain. I really hope it doesn't rain. Please, God. So here's another road, which is ba which is not allowed to be travelled. And again, this goes into Tala Tala zone. You know, that road reminds me, uh, since now you've seen that road, I'll tell you a very funny story. And uh, one time what happened was, I was on a full day safari, and I, that means you get to enter before everyone else. And then as soon as we got here, Gudabia, who was driving, uh, he said, uh, he just waited there, and he said, let's just wait here, let's see if there are any alarm calls or something. And as soon as we turned off the engine, we heard the deep growls of a female, um, 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 like that. And that time, a female named Rajvera, the legendary Rajvera, used to live there. We just waited there. Oh, racket tail, wrong, wrong. Oof, another one, right there. Wow, racket tail, wrong, What a beautiful bird. Oh, it flew away. Oh no, did you get anything? Beautiful bird, mimicry bird of India, it can make over 50 sounds and has two rackets, it's like a drongo, there racketeer drongo again. Where did you go, where did you go? Oh. The thing is they don't stop for you. And gone. Alright, no worries, we'll see more of them. Uh, okay, before I continue on the story, Lala, Sarah or no? Uh, Davadol. Davadol. From the right. From the right. Okay, we're not going to go to Sarah this morning. No problem, we'll cover it in another episode. So as I was saying, we were waiting there and we started hearing the deep-throated growls of Rajvera female. And it was winters. The sun had just come up and it was filtering on the road through the trees. And I was ready with my camera. My assistant was ready with the other cameras. The guide was ready with the camera. Back then, people who were driving were all also allowed to use cameras. So Gundav here was ready with his camera. And all the vehicles asked us what's going on. So we said, okay, there's growls. So there were about 20, 30 vehicles parked around. And the excitement was really, really high. Everyone just wanted to see a tiger. Everyone just wanted to see the king of the jungle. In this, me in this time, it was the queen of the jungle because it was a female. And the tensions were running high because we'd been waiting there for quite some time. The light is still filtering through in the forest floor and everyone is pressed and focused. Suddenly from the left, something black appears. Something small and black. And Gudabia says, Suyash, take, 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 take. Take the photos, take the photos. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And started taking photos and everyone thought it was a tiger. And we were in the best position, only we could see the road properly. So everyone thought it was a tiger. So people came rushing in. One vehicle slammed our vehicle from the right. One vehicle from the back. One vehicle from the left. And I just got rocked everywhere. Everyone was screaming like, what is happening? And Gudabia is like, it is a wild boar. 
and I'm like, oh my god, good of you. Why did you have to be so excited about a wild boar? And it just completely crushed people's dreams and crushed our vehicle as well. So things like that happen in the jungle as well, and you just have to take it in a stride. Everything is one big learning and everything is fun as well. So it's quite a good experience. But because of that, I got a beautiful shot of a wild boar running across the road in air actually and light filtering through. Does that mean the wild boar was taking out those deep throated growls? No, there was definitely a tiger because after about two more hours of waiting, the tigress also came out, walked straight towards us and we got beautiful shots. But by then, everyone was annoyed with the situation, uh, annoyed with us, us, basically making them think that there was a tiger and a wild boar came out. So all the tourists were like, you know, they're lying and they just left. So it was only us that got the shot. Patience is key. All right, let's keep driving her up. Since we've decided not to go towards Serra, uh, we're not going to be able to see some of the other locations that I want to show you guys, but I'll show you guys on the next episode. That's totally fine. We're actually going to go and check out Dottie's territory again, and then also Davidol female territory. While we're driving, I just want to point out, this is the boundary between a core and, vi and a village. In this side, of Magdi, this is the coal and that's supposed to be buffer but there is no buffer in this side. That's why they fence this area off because cattle tend to stray in. This does not stop tigers or leopards or sloth bears or even langur to move out. Of course it stops the herbivores from crossing the fence but it's basically to stop the uh, cattle from coming in. It's actually pretty sad you know they need to have a buffer here and they need to find a way to relocate some of the villages right at the boundary of the core as well. It's more easier said than done. It's not that the authorities are not trying. It's way more complicated because how much compensation do you give to the villagers? What do you give them in return? Because they've been living here. It's their ancestral property. So it's much more complicated. It's not as easy as just giving them money and then they want to move, you know. It's way more complicated. What are they going to do with their lives? All they know is farming. So you'll have to devise a program to teach them something, train them, skill them. You also have to find a suitable locations where it's okay for them to live. Do they speak the local language, local dialect? Because here in Central India, especially this part, they speak a lot of Hindi, but also Bagheli. I was just seeing if there are any pug marks, but they're not there. Langur uh, footprints, and they've just been spread out. So it's pretty tricky. But nonetheless, conservationists, government, tourists, and everyone together has to find a solution and finance that solution as well. So now we've entered Dottie's territory. The Dottie female, if you recall, is Suki Patiha's daughter from her first litter. And she's got beautiful blue eyes. She is the sister of Spotty Female, who covers an area in Tala and also covers a small part of Magdi. Dotty is raising a second litter of cubs. Beautiful young cubs. They're just between two and four months old. They're quite young right now. But I'm going to stop speaking for a little bit. I'm just going to drive and both Lala and I are going to try listen to the forest because now that we're in her territory we want to read the forest and see if we can pick up on any alarm calls and with me talking that's not possible so in the meantime you guys also enjoy the drive once again it's a pleasure to have you on this experience
Okay, we're gonna take a circle like this and come back on this road. Or maybe we decide if we find anything or if we hear alarm calls that we take a left from the area known as Charkwa Tiraha and then on to Bhul Bhulaya. So all these names that you're hearing from me uh, are actually names put by locals. It's either depending on the village that is closest or the area that the forest department has named this place or according to a specific tree, a specific kind of landscape. And in Bandhuga, we have some really fascinating areas <laughs> with quite funny names like Ghora Daman, Muram Garahiya, Giraiya, Rajbera. Well, Rajbera sounds royal though. Sehra sounds royal. Oh my god. Orange headed ground pash. Is the angle not good? Let me just change. Sorry. Sorry, Manchu. My bad. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, there was an orange-headed ground thrush, two of them actually, on the ground. But I didn't position the vehicle right eye. And the camera got stuck here. So, what I was saying is the, the names are quite funny. And some are, of course, quite royal and quite apt. I really like the names like Chakradhara, Rajbera, I already said. I really like Sehra, Davadol, another bracketail drongo. Oh, flame back woodpecker as well. Okay, bracketail drongo right there. Right there. The racket tail drongo is the mimicry bird of India and it makes more than 50 sounds. It's also seen that sometimes when photographers sit next to racket tail drongos, they tend to make the sound of the shutters clicking, <laughs> which is really funny. So I've just opened this book for you guys so you could get a closer look at the racket tail drongo. Uh, we have a lot of drongos here in India. What we're seeing right now is the greater racket tail drongo. So you see it literally looks like the, the black drongo besides two things. Number one, or three things rather. Number one, this little crown-like pattern on the head, a longer beak, and of course this racket. You got two types of racket tail drongos, the lesser and the greater. Um, but as you can see the distribution, this is number five, this is number eight. The number five greater racket tail drongo is what we see in central India. And lesser racket tail drongo is not seen in central India. It's only in northeast and parts of India. That's the sound of a uh, male cheetal deer rutting call. So here are the rack tail drongos. Oh my god. Okay, I hear some alarm calls as well. 
that I've told you about. So Lala, what do you think we should do? Okay. Okay, cool. You guys got some good stuff. Okay guys, we're gonna keep going. Hope you guys enjoyed the racket tail drongo sighting. I was hoping to get them properly and we did. They're absolutely gorgeous looking birds. And it's really cool that they can mimic so many things. Okay, cool. The alarm calls are going on. Oh, there's a peahen right here. So this is a peahen. Peacocks are, of, of course, with their long tail and be beautiful blue pattern. But... Okay, there it goes in. Yeah, it's going in, no problem. Yeah, so peahens lack the tail. They are tawny brown at the back, grayish almost. Whereas peacocks, they have these beautiful peafowl. It's called Indian peafowl and these are called peahens. Uh, so peacocks are usually the prettier ones. But the necks of peahens are greenish and they look very pretty as well. Oh, peacock display right in the front. Wow, beautiful. The peacock is displaying its feathers to the females right in the front. Look how gorgeous that is. So I'm just opening this book and I'm going to show you guys the differences between the peacock and the peahen, if I can find it. Sorry, bear with me guys. Right there. So this is the peacock, Indian peafowl, and this is the green peafowl. We don't see green peafowl in central India. There are only few places that you can see green peafowl, but Indian peafowl, all the places in India. This is the male which we see displaying, and then this is the female. You see the difference, quite a stark difference. Beautiful. So the peacock is essentially displaying its feathers to attract a mate. Okay guys, I'm just gonna take it a little further as well. Let's see if we can try getting a closer look at them. I'm gonna put the vehicle to the right or left rather, so stay ready accordingly. No, to my, yeah, my right, but I'll turn left because of the road. Left to the Babu? Right there. Wow. The alarm calls are still going on, you can hear them. Yeah, right in the front. Oh, beautiful. Please turn again, turn towards us. The alarm call that you hear is of Chital Deer. I know, I see it. 
Okay, Himanshuk, you see right here, we also have an orange-headed crown thrush, the ones that flew away from us earlier. And the peacock has stopped displaying its feathers and the orange-headed thrush has decided to hide behind a small mound. Okay, there is the orange-headed thrush again. Okay, that was pretty fun. So, I'm gonna keep going and check out these alarm calls that are coming. But hopefully you guys got a beautiful view. I knew there was a tree but I didn't want to go further and disturb him. It's better this way that we miss the shot, but the animal doesn't get disturbed. So he moved in early. There, there he is. Right there. Oh, look at those feathers. Look how gracefully they walk. <laughs> I mentioned this before, I mentioned this again. When I see a peacock walking, I only think of T-Rex because of those long legs. And the, well, because of those short legs and rather an insanely long body. Oh, how pretty. Oh, alarm calls coming from my left. I'm just going to take the vehicle back a little. Look at that sitting on the beautiful perch. Wow, beautiful perch of the peacock. So it's preening itself and cleaning itself. You know, it needs to make sure that the ladies see a clean feather. Sorry guys, I just have to move, sorry. And let them pass through. Can you still get the angle? No. Nikal yeah, right. Huh? Right. Namaste, how are you? Good. Sorry if I'm blocking your way. We were just trying to shoot the peacock. Oh Prasidi, hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. Oh, Wow. We may get a flight. Let's see if we can. Focus, focus. Gorgeous. <laughs> and that's it from our peacock. Thank you, sir, for giving us a beautiful show and for showing our virtual audience your beautiful feathers, your blue colors and patterns and your lovely behavior. I hope you enjoyed. The alarm calls are still coming from here and Lala and I think that the cubs are somewhere over here and they're just sitting down or like moving around and playing and that's why the deer are looking at it and then just giving the alarm call. Uh, not sure where the mother would be, maybe next to the cubs sleeping or somewhere else. But according to the alarm calls, I think it's the cubs. Because if the mother was moving around, yeah, it was a continuous call. Because if the mother was moving around, the calls would move away from her. And it would be 
more than one deer calling if she's moving. It's not sunny yet, but I'm going to put on my sunglasses. It's getting really dusty because of a vehicle in front of us. It's getting in my eye. But I wanted to clear a misconception a lot of people have about peacocks. And they think that peacocks, the sexual reproduction of peacocks happen as a result of the peacock male crying or shedding its tears and the female coming and drinking them and by that she conceives but that's not true that's just a common misbelief and a myth and I wanted to bust that myth today they mate regularly how birds mate and that is usually the peacock would mount the female and uh, copulate for some time and thereby spread his genes to the female and then over time she of course she gets pregnant and then she gives birth or rather she gives eggs It's also believed that the peacock dancing signals the arrival of monsoon. That's not true. Even in the peak of summer and even sometimes in the winter, you could see peacocks just playing their feathers. There's no mating season as such. But yes, of course, a little more in the summers is when the peacocks uh, display their feathers. Because what they try doing is that monsoon is a season of plenty because they eat snakes, they eat little insects and worms and monsoon is a season of plenty so they try mating in the summers so that they can give birth or rather lay eggs right before monsoon and have the eggs hatch during monsoon got some langur running on the road Look at this langur climbing the tree. Oh, gone. <laughs> He's hiding behind a leaf as if telling me that you can't see me. Look at that langur as well, little one right there. Oh, gone. No. Never mind. Yeah, so once the eggs are hatched, then of course the new chicks have so much that they can feed on and the adults can take care of them as well because there's so much to pick from because right now finding a snake or insects at this time of the year is very difficult but in the monsoon season plenty This specific path and this spray mark that I These are very fresh. Jump on the hind legs, come scratching down. Egyptian vulture. Rejoin and fix the fencing here. It's huge! Next, we need to see how long did the tiger pass here from. Uh, we know it's a male. Now, if you look at the sand, there are some tracks of the vehicle which has passed through here, which is a bike. There are tracks of some birds as well, right here. And a lot of insects have also walked through here. So those have kind of made the bug marks softer. One way of testing it fast and easy is to do a smell test. Ooh, smells musty. <laughs> I'm kidding, I, I don't have as good scent at, as Tiger does, 
Oh, I'm gonna sit a little more comfortably. I don't have as good a sense of smell as a tiger does, so I can't really say that the tiger passed here at a certain hour uh, just through the smell. But other tigers can, and that's how they communicate with each other. Tigers actually sweat through their through their glands in the in the pug marks or the paws, and that's when a tiger is moving. That's why sometimes they're sniffing the ground, they're sniffing other pug marks, they're sniffing the uh, the spray marks, the trees. So how do we find out how long did the tiger go here from? Or rather, how do we find out how old the pug mark is? So let's take a stick, okay? And let's choose this part of the sand. If you come closer, let's draw a line. Okay, and then let's take a smaller stick and draw the line as well. If you see here especially, since this is a little dry, if you see here, this is very sharp. There's some moisture as well, and here as well. What happens throughout the day is, the sun heats up the soil, the wind blows away the soil, so kind of like the wind blowing away this way. And you see, these are slowly getting softer. Let's do another comparison, okay? I'm gonna do, draw two lines and one of them I'm gonna make softer. Whoops, sorry, let me take something else. Let's take this. Okay, so this is line number one. And this is line number two. And I'm only gonna make this softer and then you'll see the difference. So over time, the wind blows over and you see, now that has appeared softer than this one because the edges here are very refined and very sharp. So now let's come back to the pug marks. If you see here, the edges are not as refined. The depth of the pug mark is still there because of course the tiger, it's a male, it's a heavy male. So the depth is still there, but the edges are not as refined. You also might be wondering, Suyash, why don't we see any claws? Well, tigers have retractable claws. So only if they are running, they open the, the, the claws if they're hunting. Um, otherwise, they always keep it closed. So if they're hunting, the claw marks will come, kind of come like this in the stride. Next, we need to see another thing. Where has the tiger come from and where it is going? That's how you track tigers. So the tiger has actually come from here and the first bug marks are right here. If you see, I made a circle. The second one's here and it keeps going. And here, you see, these are not bug marks. These are bug marks, these are hoof marks. These are of cattle, domesticated cattle. Again, since we are outside the national parks, domestic cattle come in and out and the tigers probably come out to either mark his territory or actually hunt uh, the domestic cattle as well. Sorry, Himanshu just had a slip. <laughs> Let's keep following them. See, tiger, domestic cattle. Tiger, domestic cattle. Here you see the comparison. Fight, tiger, domesticated cattle. Here you have some other pug, hoof marks, not pug marks, sorry. Can anyone guess what this is? These are of cheetal deer. Let's keep walking. So see now, the soil here has completely changed. Okay, it is hardly anything is visible because it's so hard. So what do you do now? We know that the tiger is walking this way, so we keep following it. And I see kind of a riverbed going down. So I'm just gonna go till there and see if there are pug marks. If there aren't any pug marks, then I have to spend some more time trying to figure out which position it is that the tiger will go towards. So we have some more hoof marks here. Right here. More hoof marks, more hoof marks. Ah, there's the pug mark. Yeah. Here. Again, these are very nice, the imprint. Again, we can see that these are old because other animals have walked through here and when the other animals were walking, the sand has kind of um, sprinkled onto our pug mark as well. 
the two bikes that have passed through here, the humans that have passed through here. So that is Suyash Keshri's Pug Marks, but that is not Suyash Keshri, that's someone else. <laughs> so, you see, we share our land with tigers. We are here in a private property, a private area. It's a huge, huge farmland. Um, there's a resort as well, but the park boundary is not too far away. And since this does not have many boundaries, the, the area is not fenced off. It's actually good because animals can pass through here as well. We are fencing too many places off. And, and for tigers to pass through here can be slightly concerning because humans and cattle are also passing through here. But this tiger has never caused any trouble. I've never heard of it causing any troubles here besides killing cattle and the cattle owners. Yes, it's a loss to them, but they get fair compensation. Uh, we will cover that in other parts of the episode as well. But that's all I wanted to cover here. The idea is when you get closer to the ground and get away from the vehicle, you can understand so much more. You can, you can gather so much more. And there's so much to learn, especially through tracking. It is a dying art form. I absolutely love it and I wish more people did it in such detail. See you on the drive now. Yeah, the sun's starting to shine finally. You see there, it looks pretty beautiful. Okay, here are the pug marks. Oops, sorry. Uh, how should I pos position the vehicle? That's okay. Okay, here are the pug marks. They are from early this morning because the sand has been spread out and it's not as fresh. A lot of vehicles have gone over here as well. So maybe the female came and drank water and then left. Yeah, I'm just gonna drive a little bit so you can see the pug marks as well. over here as well this is pretty clear okay this one is very clear right here and I think the female has gone like this and then gone over that way I'm just gonna take it a couple meters again and see if there are any more pug marks here. No pug marks here, so there is a little bit of a confusion because I couldn't see the crossing mark. So if the pug marks were on that side, maybe the female crossed this way, but it could also be possible the female crossed this way and a vehicle drove over the pug marks. So I don't really know which side it is. Lala, what do you think, what should we do? There are some pug marks here. Okay, though, so the pug marks are still going. If you see here, pug marks are still going. Right here. Right here. Wapas are here. So these ones actually are coming back and these ones are going front. So maybe she walked and then she decided to return. But we're just going to check up ahead as well. Yeah, see, they're still going. They're still going, they're still going. Yeah, the pug marks are still going. See, on the sand again. Those, those ones, and they keep going all the way to the back yeah right here right here yeah still going see this she has definitely walked a lot and okay the pug marks are not there anymore Okay, the back here on the left, or rather on, on my right. They've come here like this, still going, still going. Now they're on my left, 
and they're still going. It's back on to the right. <laughs> She's walking in a zigzag pattern. Yeah, still going. Wow. She has walked so much. Still going. Still going. There, there. And up ahead as well. Still going. Oh, this one's really fresh actually. This one. Look at that. Look at that, that's so fresh. You can see it's sharp. You see it on this? It's so sharp, these edges. Okay, I'm just gonna keep following these pug marks and see where they lead me. Lala, hey. that water hole in the front, jam hole. Hey. Do you think we should check that? Yes, sir. Okay. So there's a water hole in the front, uh, quite a little while from here, about a kilometer from here, called Jam Hole. And I see the pug marks are still going. And I kind of want to know if she's walked so much, maybe she's thirsty and maybe gone for a drink there, or maybe somewhere around. It's still her territory, so she might need to remark it because she hasn't been seen there for a long time. Ah, and the pug marks are still going. Ah, the sun is out. I love it. Yeah, the pug marks are still going. Oh, wow. White eyed buzzard. Beautiful. My God. Wow, white-eyed buzzard. Beautiful. Oh, he, he sat there, up there. I think uh, our second cameraman, Nithin, is getting quite good shots of it. Okay, but we need to keep following the pug mark, so we're going to keep going. He's actually shooting against the sky, so you might be witnessing a very bright image, known as a high-key image. There he is on top of me, the wide-eyed buzzard, if you want to quickly see. Yeah, alarm calls. Alarm calls, guys. I'm not going to stop. The alarm calls are in the same direction as what the uh, pug marks went on this side. They're coming from here. These deer are looking at us. And running away, look at them. Look at the deer running away. They just made alarm calls. There are some, some deer right in front of me as well. Right there. 
right there. And it's a frenzy. Look at these deer as well, on my left. Fencing can see the fence. Look at We're just going to go ahead and check because there's a little bit of a confusion between the deer here. They look nervous and they're running around, but some are looking this way, some are looking this way, and some are looking that way. Running. Don't, don't point at the deer, look at the, the look at the deer on the left. Beautiful male. And there he goes. Right there. What got you nervous, dude? What got you nervous? He might cross the road in front of us. Yeah. Ah, look at that graceful walk. No, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Look at the lighting, perfectly golden. Sorry about the dashboard, everybody. That's the part of our vehicle but we'll still get a good look at the deer because he's going to cross the road from up ahead of us and as he does i'm going to duck from the scene and try to move it myself wow wow look at that look beautiful lala the calls are still coming but do, do you think it's from the tigers at the fence? Yeah. So here they have an enclosure not too far away from here where they keep the old or the injured tigers uh, that are not able to survive in the wild or the tigers I spoke about earlier, Kankati Jr. Her cubs, her, one of her cubs have been put here. Or if a mother dies and a cub survive, they put here in the enclosure where they live their life in captivity, which is big captivity, um, far removed from zoos and human habitation. So we can't go and see those tigers at all. But I think these deer are looking at that tiger over there <laughs> inside the fence and saying, or sounding the alarm. So confusing sometimes because this is Dottie's area and she sits on that road also. So it could be Dottie, it could be not the tigers, we don't know. But since we're sitting here, I'm just going to take off my jacket. It's become nice and warm. A lot of people ask me these shirts that I wear, which has this beautiful uh, dog-like pattern. And it's actually owned by one of my friends back in the US. Three of my friends, actually. They, they're partners. Um, and it's called Roback. So the logo is actually a Rhodesian Ridgeback and just here as well is the Ridgeback and it's nice and comfortable. The collars are very nice and tight and they actually used to work with me together in Washington DC when I used to work uh, in, in the US House of Re Representatives and then at a political advocacy firm before I decided to leave all of it, follow my passion. Uh, make my career in life um, as an entrepreneur, as a social entrepreneur, and as a wildlife filmmaker and presenter. Yeah, this is nice. Okay, Lala, what should we do? 
जमहोल ओके कंटिन्यू ऑन टू चेकिंग द जमहोल वाटर होल एंड आई एम जस्ट गोट फाइंड अ वे टू put this jacket right here nice off we go okay we've got some a bird let me see the binoculars please okay let me see where did it go okay there all right if you follow my hand okay follow it to the gap that you see on the tree for the gap picture right zoom in left zoom in to the left uh, to the right yep right there right there focus right there you see that bird it's a white eyed buzzard so that's the same bird we were seeing earlier Look at this deer looking at us. Right in front of front of our vehicle, huge male deer. Looking a little nervous. And there he goes. Look, he's looking on the right. And now back to eating. So if you see the langur on the top So if you see right on the top of the tree the langur monkeys and what the langurs are doing is they're quite me quite messy eaters and they essentially dropping a lot of the leaves a lot of the sal flowers and the deer is having a good time chomping it away down below so that's why a lot of people think langur and deer are friends but that's not the case they are just codependent or rather live alongside each other because they benefit from each other when langur are here down in the bottom the deer look for look out for them and do any alarm call because they deer can see further than langur when they are sitting down because they're taller and the deer benefit from langur because langurs are messy eaters as well as they can see far into the forest from the top of the trees it's quite an interesting fact okay we'll continue on to jamhol langur oh <laughs> climbing the tree right here if you follow my hand right on this tree right on this tree right on this tree yeah up 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 there right there Oh, more on the right as well. Right on that tree. ठीक सब ठीक है नल ठीक है. So these are the red-faced monkeys, Rhesus macaque. The other monkeys that we have here are black-faced, which are Indian langur. See this Reese's macaque on this tree. He's gonna climb up. Wow, beautiful! Good job, Imanshu. 
lots of activity going on. And you see over there, deer and langur together as well. Look how amazing it is to see him holding the tree like that. He's hugging it, literally. <laughs> hey buddy, is that your favorite tree? I wonder if he's going to climb up or climb down. Some of the other members are climbing down. There he is. Look at that reddish pink face. Oh, that's a nice zoom out habitat shot. That's beautiful. Oh, there he comes down. And gone. <laughs> okay, we've got some parakeet here as well. If you follow my hand, right there, let me see if it's a rose ring parakeet or alexandrine parakeet, right on the top of the tree. Let me see real quick with my binoculars and confirm. Yep, that's an alexandrine parakeet. Beautiful bird. Okay, I'm gonna move the vehicle. Here on my right, we have some rhesus macaque on the ground. We have got one mother with her young one, just to my right. I'm not gonna point at her because she, that might scare her. Can you get the angle? Mm -hmm. yeah. This yeah, beautiful. Yep, right there. She's thinking, where should she go? There are other members of her troop going in all directions, and she's a little, she looks a little confused as to whether she should follow those troops, or rather follow her troop, or stick here. Just like langurs, rhesus macaques are also social animals. They live in a troop. Some deer out in the distance with monkeys, with the langur monkeys. There's one scratching himself. Lots of distractions in the foreground, but that's okay. That's just how it is. And it's getting a little sunny. Uh, we're gonna continue on to the water hole. I'm just gonna put on my hat. Please don't mind me. I think we've spent a lot of time with langur deer and rhesus macaque. And I, I'm hoping that <laughs> That time doesn't cost us with the tiger, with missing the tiger. But even if it does, if it does, that's okay. We enjoyed our time. It's all about observation. It's all about enjoying your time in the forest, whether it be with a big, big cat or one of the smaller little animals or even a bird. So we're gonna keep going to Jamhol Waterhole, which is just coming up. Sorry, it's a little bumpy. I'm sorry, guys. I'm gonna go a little slow. <laughs> I don't want the cameraman 
other guy to be flying away. I'm more worried about the camera. It's okay, the other ones will be fine. <laughs> Alright, flat down, which is so much better than the bumps and humps. I don't know why, but for some weird reason, saying humps over and over again made me think about this reel that's gone really famous of a dog, well, multiple dogs, different people have used the same reel, but they're really famous nowadays. And it's just a voiceover of some guy saying something and, and the dog's just wagging their tail. And the guy is just like, a happy, a happy guy, just a happy, happy, happy guy. Oh, just a little bit of happy guy, a happy, happy, happy dude. <laughs> and the dogs are just wagging their tail and it looks so cute. If you can't tell already, I'm a big dog lover. I thought I heard something, but that was just a peacock. Uh, if you, I'm a big dog lover, I'm a big animal lover, but I absolutely adore dogs. Here we are at Jabol Waterhole. There's a deer here. Oh, another one here. Sorry, I didn't see you. So if you've seen the trailer of Safari with Suyash, this right here, what you see, this path is where the tiger walks near the water hole. I've seen a tiger here playing in the water. What I'm actually gonna do is, while we wait here for some time to see if we can hear any alarm calls, I'm actually gonna play some footage that I've recorded in the past of tigers here. And this one that you're going to be seeing is a male cub, well, male sub-adult, and he was from Dottie's first litter.
Lala says that there were some alarm calls behind Jamhol earlier this morning. That's what the vehicles told us, or told him rather. So we're just gonna we're just gonna check ahead, and there's a samba as well on the road. Beautiful, quite far away from me, but I don't want to disturb him. Right between the Sal forest. Oh my God, that is a beautiful shot. Hey dude, how are you doing? Have you seen any tigers? <laughs> and he realizes we're not a threat. And off he goes. And just like that, off we go too. Yeah, so I was saying earlier that we're just gonna go check this drainage line up ahead and then decide from there what to do. Lala, where we were hearing the alarm calls in Dottie's territory, do you think we should go check that or should we just stay here? Okay. Okay, cool. So Lala says we're just going to check the drainage line and then we'll decide what we should do next. movement of tigers. It is so important for the person driving and even for people sitting at the back, tourists or the guide, to keep scanning the forest. Usually I tend to look more at the road because I'm looking for the pug marks, but ever so often you wanna, you wanna take your head up and then look from left to right and then right to left. And basically what I'm trying to look for is, oh, there's a wild boar on the left. Yeah, you guys can't really see properly because there are too many bushes. No problem. But what I was trying to say is that when you're scanning like this, there he is, you can get a good look at him. Oh, one more runs away. <laughs> All right, we'll continue. What I was trying to say is that what you're trying to look for when scanning the forest is a break in the outline or the shadows. Just how I spotted these two wild boars, it's by looking at the forest and scanning. And I know that right now the shadows are coming from this side and going towards this side because the sun is shining on my right. So shadows are coming from here and then going here. So if a shadow is going this way or like breaking that outline, then I know something's there. So this is the drainage line Lala was talking about. Right here, look how beautiful it is. 
So you're also looking, while scanning, you're also looking for different colors, uh, be it orange or yellow or black. For example, there aren't many black rocks in Bandhakar. So I know the landscape really well. And if I see something black, I immediately stop because it can only be one of three things. Number one, that is one of those black rocks that is only present in some places. Number two, a sloth bear. Number three, a wild boar. What should we do, Lala? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should we go back to Dottie's area? Or stay, go somewhere else? Murdhava check it out, sir. Let's go back. Murdhava? Okay. 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 Murdhava from Kiraha, Kiraha from... Davadol. Davadol. Okay, cool. So... So what we've decided is, there's nothing here. We're not going to go back to the Dottie's territory just yet. We're actually going to go and check out this area called Murdhava and Dabadol. Dabadol is, as I said earlier, um, so I'm just going to turn the vehicle around. Dabadol, as I said earlier in one episode, is Dottie's um, cousin sister. They're from the same female. I also want to point out something right here if you see this tree you see the bark is kind of stripped off and can you ever wonder what did that so what's happened is this is done by a wild elephant actually they're trying to eat the bark of the sal tree so they essentially use that tusk to hit the tree and then they use their trunk to kind of gather it and then put it in their mouth. So if you look closer, there are some patterns that, that show where the tusk has gone in as well. Pretty cool, pretty fascinating. But we're going to continue on. So nothing in this drainage line. Thorn bill. Upper a bahut thorn bill. Ah, thorn bill. Right there. Indian grey thorn bill. Right there. If you follow my hand, can you see it? Zoom out. Go up, go up, go up, left. Right there, there's the grey hornbill. That's the Indian grey hornbill, a pretty common bird, quite a prehistoric looking bird, as you can see. And if it chose to give us a closer look, you will see its beautiful beak. Fighting. <laughs> oh my god. Wow, we got four jackals and they're running away from something. There's some pug marks here. So 
these ones actually are coming back and these ones are going front so maybe she walked and then she decided to turn. But we're just going to check up ahead as well. Yeah, see they're still going. They're still going. Chital alarm call is coming right from here. Langur as well. Langur alarm call. I'm just gonna get up. Right there. You can see the langur. Okay, right there, yeah. Right, there's the tiger over there. There, tiger, tiger. Wow, beautiful. Beautiful, guys. You guys can hear the langur call. There he is. And you can also hear kitch, kitch, kitch. Usually langurs do that for leopards, but this is a cub the size of a leopard, so that's why they're doing kitch, kitch as well. That kind of sound. The cough is usually for tigers. Where did you go, boy? Okay, the tiger should come somewhere, somewhere around here. Oh, there he comes out. He's going to come out in the open. Beautiful light. Amazing. So he is a, he is a cub right now, even though he looks pretty big. And he's standing right behind those trees. You can barely see him. So the tiger is going to come out somewhere here. Let's focus on the grass. There he is. They're beautiful. Wow. Absolutely stunning. So this is a male cub of Dabadol female. Look at the cormorant right next to him. 
<laughs> He's gonna get up on that log. Oh wow. Absolutely gorgeous. I've never actually seen a tiger on that log and it had been a dream. And that dream came true today. See, focus, focus, focus. Wow, it's crowd, right? The tiger somewhere still here. Um, because the Namur is seeing it and making the alarm calls, but he's hidden somewhere in the grass. And man, the tiger is bold. He's gonna grow up to be a really, really bold tiger, quite like his father Muhammad. So once again, this is Darbadol's male cub. Um, they are between eight and both the cubs are between eight and ten months old right now, but already they look really big. Yep, there he is, climbing the wall. Okay, just hold on. Uh, the tiger's actually gone up. So we're just gonna see if he's gone up or just sitting on the grass. That's where he entered from, right in the corner. And our cameraman Himanshu will tell me if he can see anything. No, he's not there. Meanwhile, we could see the two beautiful woolly neck stock here. This one's quite close to us right now. Right now, if you see closer, you can also make out kind of purplish hue running through its wings. They're distinguished from other stalks by the fluffy white neck contrasting with the black body and wings. And they prefer marshy areas and wet grasslands within the forest. Seems like he's going to reposition himself. <laughs> oh! <laughs> There's one more sitting right here. If you zoom out and then zoom in, right there. So this is the stork that we're looking at, the woolly neck stork. If you zoom in, you see the reddish eyes and the white on the throat. And of course, this long beak, which is completely black. And this is white, unlike other storks. All right. I don't think we'll see the tiger again. There are a lot of vehicles parked there anyway. So we're going to call it a day. What an amazing day it has been all the way seeing the seeing the beautiful porcupine, which is a quite a rare sight. I've never seen a porcupine in my life, as I said. Then waiting for the alarm calls, seeing the jackals howling, and of course, tracking Dottie, tracking Darbadol, and finally ending up here and seeing one of Darbadol's male cubs. Uh, 
<laughs> what is funny is that he really doesn't look like a cub unless you know what an actual male tiger looks like. You'll think that he is a fully grown male. What an amazing day it has been. Thank you so much for joining uh, this virtual safari experience. Once again, my name is Suyash Keshri and on first camera we have Himanshu Yadav. On second camera we have Nitin Krishna and our guide is one and only Lala. We'll catch you on the next safari. If you have any questions, please don't forget to leave it in the comments right here. Please follow this channel and if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to us on safariwithsuyash at gmail.com and also see our website suyashkeshi.com. If you're interested in coming on a safari with me, please reach out to me on Instagram uh, or you can also see the information on our website. So I'll see you guys on the next episode. Until then, take care. Goodbye.